Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today is part of our series on Huey P. Long, it's episode 4, The Dynamite Squad and the Round Robin Ears. Last time, we saw Huey take over as governor of Louisiana. Now initially, he was able to steamroll a lot of his program through the stunned legislature and seize an awful lot of political control from the establishment. But, when he tried to impose a new severance tax on the oil companies to pay for his programs, his opponents came back with a vengeance. They brought charges of impeachment against him, basically throwing the book at everything that Huey had done, and Huey's attempts to shut down the legislature nearly resulted in a riot. In March of 1929, just a year after he'd assumed office, it looked perfectly possible that Huey would be impeached and go down in state, not national history, as a bizarre footnote, a rush of blood to the head before the establishment regained control. In the days after the riot, Huey was seen depressed, downhearted, dispirited. His brother Julius, who he'd had a stormy relationship with since their shared legal practice fell apart, well Julius feared that he might even commit suicide. It certainly seemed that his political career was over, with the media and his opposition lined up against him. But of course this is not what happened. Huey wasn't going to let it happen. And as he so often did when things seemed to be turning against him, he went back to the one group of people who had always loved and supported him, the people of Louisiana. Frantically, in the days after the Bloody Monday riot had brought impeachment charges to the table, Huey began printing circular messages and newsletters to be distributed to his supporters. Huey knew that the key way to win a political battle is to define the terms of the fight. If Huey allowed the focus to be on his character and his autocratic, anti-democratic corruption, it'd be over before it began. The reality was that Huey had probably done enough to be impeached under the Louisiana Constitution, which at any rate was vague about what you had to do to get yourself impeached. If the focus was on Huey versus the law, he may well have lost, but impeachment is a very political process. It's the unseating of an executive by a body of legislatures, and if politics doesn't dictate that someone needs to be impeached, the law doesn't matter so much. So Huey decided to make the battle his favourite political fight. Huey and the people versus the big, evil corporations. He slammed his political opponents, the Dynamite Squad, for being bought and paid for by Standard Oil. Pamphlets and circulars were distributed with astonishing speed. In classic propaganda fashion, Huey's autobiography describes how all the farmers, merchants and workers selflessly handed out pamphlets to support their hero, and that ever since then, the newspapers have been rendered powerless in the politics of Louisiana. In reality, it wasn't all kind-hearted people who loved Huey handing these things out in their free time. They were handed out by his army of state employees, policemen and some supporters. The money, incidentally, to print these was funded by his shady business associate, Robert Maestri. You know, the guy who sold beds for brothels and donated to the long campaign. In the pamphlets, he struck an anti-standard oil line. I would rather go down to a thousand impeachments than admit that I am the governor of the state that does not dare to call the standard oil company to account so that we can educate our children and care for the destitute, sick and afflicted. Huey called mass rallies, warning his supporters to beware the lying newspapers, pay no attention to what they say. At the rallies, he quoted his favourite poem, Invictus, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. But for all this defiance, he can't have felt really like that was true. Pro-impeachment parades took place at the same time, and fights broke out between the protesters that very nearly devolved into riots. Tensions were high in the polarised state. Everyone was forced to pick a side. Even some of Huey's closest supporters, like his childhood friend Harley Bozeman, begged for him to resign. Huey was furious at the perceived disloyalty, or maybe lack of faith, and their friendship never recovered. As Huey tried to frame the debate, the Dynamite Squad put their charges to the House of Representatives. So in order to impeach, they just needed straight majorities from the House and from the Senate. Now you'll remember that they threw a vast array of charges at Huey, some serious allegations of corruption and violating the Constitution, and some general character smears of frivolous nature that he was cavorting with prostitutes and plotting assassinations. In the manner of Louisiana politics, there was an absurd sense of theatre to the proceedings. One moment, a doddery old prolonged delegate would be comparing him to Jesus and then fainting dramatically on the floor, the next, a hula dancer hired by the opposition, would be describing him as very frisky. It later turned out that the hula dancer had been offered a job for swearing this story to be true. As far as the serious charges went, bribery was first up on the docket. But this was difficult to prove, 
Aside from some reports of Huey bragging about buying legislatures and the fact that the, his supporters mysteriously seem to be appointed to key positions in government, it all looked suspicious, it all smelled bad, but it was very difficult to prove individual cases of bribery. The issue for the Dynamite Squad with trying to pin Huey down for this charge was, firstly, pretty much every other governor had also doled out jobs to their supporters, and amongst the Dynamite Squad there were plenty of people who had done that themselves. An investigation into bribery might be bad for them too, if you catch my drift. Certainly no one wanted to take bribery allegations too far, because everyone was doing it. A more damning and perhaps safer charge was that Huey had mishandled state funds. Here's an example. $6,000 had been requested by Huey to entertain some senators. His pretty young secretary, Alice Lee Grosjean, had withdrawn the entire amount in $20 bills. The previous year, Huey's request for funding to buy a new car had been denied by the Conservatives in the legislature. The day after Alice withdrew the six grand, Huey bought himself a new Buick, paid for entirely in $20 bills. The man in charge of Huey's personal finances, Seymour Weiss, was called to the stand on April 4th. But by April 6th, they'd still got nothing out of him, except the same old story about how the money was spent on the senators. Eventually, after all the theatrics and drama of the impeachment trial, the House dropped some of the more ridiculous and unsubstantiated charges. For example, Huey's alleged ordering of an assassination attempt on his enemy Sanders, which wasn't very credible. But they passed by a majority vote 8 out of 19 charges. These included his attempting to intimidate and blackmail the newspaper owner, Charles Manship, by exposing his brother's mental illness that we talked about last episode. They also included misappropriating the state funds to buy a car, amongst other things, and attempted bribery. There was also a catch-all charge that accused Huey of, quote, incompetency and temperamental unfitness, end quote, that the House passed. No comment. All of the prolonged attempts to stall the charges and slow the progress of the House were ultimately foiled. But Huey was still determined to fight this tooth and nail, literally. While they were debating the last charge, a representative of the Dynamite Squad rushed into the chamber, blood pouring from his cheek. Huey's brother, Earl, had bitten him in a fight. Huey's sanguine response when informed of the fight? I bet he bit him, didn't he? Earl always bites. This strategy of biting your opponents didn't save Huey in the House, or in his words, the so-called House of Representatives, and in the eyes of the state turned to the Senate, where Huey's final fate would be decided. A two-thirds majority would be needed to impeach Huey. If nothing else, the career of Huey Long shows you that people in Louisiana loved a good political drama. Everyone, from the politicians, to the lying newspapers, to political spectators, they were all eagerly awaiting the next round of testimony and voting. Except it never happened. Two days after the Senate convened, one of Huey's senators announced that he had something to show to the court. It was a petition from some of the senators. In it, they explained that, since the legislature was technically supposed to adjourn on April the 6th, any charge filed after that date was illegal and invalid. Therefore, the senators regretfully announced, all of the charges from the House were illegal and should be dropped. Huey could not be impeached, at least not today, and they should all just go home. Incredulously, one of the senators asked, you would vote to acquit him regardless of the evidence? All of the senators who had signed the declaration said they stood by it. There were 15 senators who'd signed the declaration, one more than was needed to block the two-thirds impeachment majority. There was nothing the dynamite squad could do. Regardless of the evidence presented before them, these men were with Huey. This round-robin letter has become an infamous coup in Louisiana legal history, and it really is incredible to think that Huey basically got off on the flimsiest possible technicality. But then you have to remember... The issue had never been about the law. The issue had never been about whether the charges were true, or whether they were legal grounds for impeachment. Realistically, this hadn't been the issue in the House either. But this was all about personal enmities and loyalties, rather than the rule of law. And in the end, the crucial issue was how many senators got bought by Huey, and how many got bought by Standard Oil. While the Dynamite Squad were preparing their charges, and everyone's eyes were fixated on this dramatic public testimony in the House, the theatre of it. Prolong and Standard Oil men were scurrying around Louisiana, offering briefcases full of cash to anyone with a vote. <laughs>
Huey's autobiography gives a stunningly biased account of what went on, with allegations that Standard Oil were offering $250,000 to each senator, and that it was only the loyalty of his close friends and associates who refused financial payments that saved him from disgrace. I have to admit, on a personal note, I really loved reading Huey's account. He did have a sense for the big, exciting, dramatic Hollywood moments of heroism. There's this one story where he's saying at one point, a prolonged senator gets offered the position of governor in exchange for flipping his vote. It's ridiculous, that never happened. And Huey and his friends are waiting anxiously by the telephone for news. Then they hear, he's turned him down, and everybody cheers. Huey, heart warmed, concludes, the intense hate of my enemies is more than offset by the loyalty of my friends. Now, even though I know that Huey's amazingly unreliable, that the man in question probably took a bribe, the story is so well written it feels like a triumph for morals and decency in the face of wicked corruption and corporations. That's how good Huey was at selling himself and painting himself as a hero. He justifies the somewhat sketchy nature of the round robin, the undemocratic nature of it, by painting his opponents as bought and paid for, so crooked that they'd impeach regardless of the evidence. As so often, when you tell Huey that he's corrupt, he throws up his hands and says, Look at the other guys! What choice did I have? Obviously, the nature of this kind of shady backroom deal means that our actual records are sketchy, but the whole round robin episode just smacks of a coup. And we do have quite a lot of accounts about what went on. Until the impeachment, I had no idea how low humanity could sink, said one senator. And there's one particularly golden example of humanity sinking way, way down, concerning one senator called Anderson. It all started when Anderson, who had been pro-Long, put out a statement in a newspaper saying that he wasn't necessarily committed to Long. This is basically him waving a big flag that says, if someone wants to bribe me, my door is open. When Huey quizzed him about it, he evasively said that he had to go to another town for a meeting. Suspicious, Huey followed him and demanded to know what was going on. Anderson admitted that he'd been negotiating with Long's enemies, but he basically said, Huey, I can explain. I was trying to entrap these guys. You know, so it has to look like realistic blackmail. Once they gave me the money, I was going to turn it all the way over to you. Clearly, Senator Anderson was trying to play both sides, maybe hoping to spark a bidding war for his loyalty. But Huey was more cunning than that. Anderson, as you might expect, was no saint. He liked drinking, and he liked women, and it was a combination of both that led Huey's men to discover him in bed with a prostitute. And I'm sure they were shocked, just shocked. A combination of blackmail and a decent bribe meant that Anderson signed the round robin. Even the nature of the coup shows that Huey was not naive about how this impeachment was going to be fought. He had outfoxed his opponents, he'd outbribed them. And getting people to sign this letter prevented them from changing their vote later if they found someone who valued their loyalty more. Huey recognised the weakness in the system. Undoubtedly, he got away with crimes as a result. But it wasn't like previous leaders hadn't engaged in similar shenanigans. As ever with Huey, the main difference was just how flagrant he was with it. Huey valued the loyalty of his friends immensely, as was demonstrated by the fact that he immediately went on holiday with the Round Robin Inns to celebrate. Every single one of the Round Robin signers was rewarded in some way. Many of them got jobs, lucrative contracts. At least one probably took his payment in cash. It's not corruption, it's just rewarding loyalty, right? At the same time, though, Huey knew that the adjournment didn't prevent the impeachers from trying again, and his attacks on them were as vicious as any in Louisiana history. He tried to get them recalled in special elections, fired their relatives from jobs, made threats and carried out reprisals against those who had been against him. Having faced near-political extinction, his paranoia and determination to destroy his enemies only grew. He went everywhere with bodyguards, some armed with shotguns and rifles. You can see them in archive footage of Huey, and he was determined to consolidate his power. A purge in the state government meant that even minor officials who were demonstrably anti-Long got removed from office. This was 1929-30. The Great Depression was kicking in. Of course it hit the poor of Louisiana especially hard, and this meant that Huey's lucrative state jobs were more valuable than ever. They could prove the difference between your family eating and destitution. Huey summed up his new attitude after the impeachment. I used to get things done by saying please. Now, I dynamite them out of my path. <laughs>
Maybe using the nickname of his old enemies gave him a degree of ironic pleasure. Huey, though, was facing up to the same kind of issue that the radical populist reformers have had since the Gracchi brothers in the Roman Republican days. The conservative movements that opposed him were so entrenched, so unwilling to accept any kind of reform, and so unwilling to accept such a brash and bold character as Huey, that Huey in some ways had no choice but to subvert political norms in order to get anything done. And then the cycle just escalates. Huey has to become less and less of a conventional politician. The conservatives hate him more and more and try to block him and stall him more and more, until eventually the rule of law and democracy is just thrown apart in this incredibly polarised situation. His actions are not inconsistent with having some principles, some ideals, and a desire to help ordinary people. He, at the same time, he was clearly no saint. All portrayals should remember his corruption and heavy-handed tactics, and a lot of them don't. But the ferocity of the impeachment attempt probably only convinced him further that, in order to achieve any real reform, dynamite would be needed. In Huey's mind, the political system was too broken to be useful. So why not go around it? The thing is, as ever, Huey was much smarter than he ever let on. He used dynamite where he could, but he was very aware of real politique, and like many a good autocrat, he had an intimate knowledge of the edges and limitations of his own power. If he didn't, the fact that his rivals had come so close to a successful impeachment would have told him. So he struck a deal with some of his rivals and some of the wealthy businessmen, a sort of truce. The severance tax that had sparked this entire debate was quietly dropped, and, in exchange, the impeachment charges were not seriously pursued, for now. At the same time as making deals and fighting back against specific rivals, Huey wanted to control the media landscape of the state more generally. He did this by launching his own newspaper, the Louisiana Progress. If the lying newspapers weren't on his side, after all. The Progress reported from a prolonged standpoint, but the highlight was certainly its cartoons. In one of them, Huey's enemies, including Sanders and Senator Rancel, bring a lengthy legal document before Huey, while he's there, nobly handing out school books in a crowd of adoring children, all of whom express their horror and dismay that anyone would want to stop their hero, Huey. The cartoons feature a spidery handwriting that fills up almost the entire panel sometimes, and while they're clearly biased and oozing propaganda, they're charming in their own way. As well as a venue for his soft propaganda, the progress provided Huey with a mouthpiece to attack his opponents, and the other newspapers came in for particular criticism. The only reason you read them is to see what they're saying about me, Huey opined about the press in one editorial. Another, less cheeky and more vicious one, described them as double-crossing polecats, guzzling like bleary-eyed hogs from a trough filled with malice, lies and hypocrisy. Ah, they just don't do bias like they used to. Well, maybe the Daily Mail. Huey's attacks on the media weren't limited to animal metaphors in his editorials, though. In 1930, he proposed a 15% tax on revenue in newspapers, on the advertising revenue, which was rightly seen as an attempt to strangle their business and close many of them down. He also introduced several bills that strengthened libel laws, probably hoping to take newspapers to court with enhanced power. These measures were defeated, and in the case of the 15% tax, it was actually ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, the First Amendment protecting freedom of speech. If Huey had his way, you imagine he would have curtailed free speech considerably. Like many a demagogue who insists that they're beloved by the people, he was still wary of the free press. Alongside railing at enemies, Huey had to contend with the very real problems of the Great Depression and trying to force through his ambitious schemes. There is quite an incredible episode that's almost identical to a scene from It's a Wonderful Life, with a Huey long twist. A bank owner, scared immediately after the Wall Street crash that there'll be a run on the bank, where well, he calls Huey up. I've never been for you, but save this bank and I'll be prolonged for life, he says. Huey shows up at the bank the next day. If you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, you'll remember that the goody two-shoes George Bailey pays all of the customers with his own money. Huey adopted a different tactic. Whenever anyone tried to withdraw her funds, he said, I was here before you. If you insist on taking out your money... I'll take the state's money out first. This bank will fold and there'll be nothing left to pay you. This gun battle diplomacy worked and the bank run was prevented. 
But in spite of events like this adding to Huey's little book of political rapscallion anecdotes, in other areas his policies were stalling, or even just moving slightly more slowly than he'd hoped. The restlessness of the man was always present. He'd ordered the Capitol building in the state to be torn down and replaced with a new one. When the former president, Calvin Coolidge, came to visit him, Huey could barely contain the quips about his ambition. The photograph taken of them, he said, was of once and future presidents, and he joked that if he had found the White House in disrepair, he'd have to have that building torn down and replaced as well. Huey was not willing to be bogged down in the local politics of Louisiana. The state that had held such love for him was just a political springboard. And it's not like he could find much comfort in those local politics anyway. Although his schoolbook program had been passed, and he'd avoid impeachment, Huey had struggled against anti-long legislatures in the House and Senate to get any major appropriation bills passed for his infrastructure programmes. Lots of them needed two-thirds majorities, and the anti-long bloc was still large enough to block them. Indeed, the legislative session in 1930 barely passed any legislation at all. This, as much as anything else, explains Huey's next move, a move that sums up his career. Radical, unexpected, throwing everyone else off balance, Huey appealed to his popular support to overcome the stuffed shirt legislative elite and allow him to break the rules and further his own ambition. On July 15th, 1930, only two years into his four-year term as governor, Huey announced that he was running as a candidate for the US Senate. Now we know that this was just another step in his five-year plan, but at the time, Huey was more diplomatic about it. He had to sell this to the people after all. By electing him to the Senate, his supporters would demonstrate an overwhelming mandate to pass his infrastructure programme. Legislators who didn't bend to the will of the people would be publicly signing their own death warrant, according to Huey. Lined up against Huey in the election was the friend-turned-enemy, fervent anti-longite, Senator Joseph Ranzel. Huey had probably been thinking about running for the Senate for months, but there was a slight problem. Timing. There was an overlap. Huey's term as governor expired four months after the new Senate term began. Normally this wouldn't be a problem. He could go to the Senate and leave some loyal underling in charge of the governorship, and previous politicians had done this before. The only issue was that the lieutenant governor was Paul Sear, and after their falling out over that murder case, Sear hated Huey's guts. Huey was in a bizarre situation. If he ever left Louisiana, Sear would have all the powers of an acting governor, and would do everything he could with that power to ruin Huey. He was a hostage to his own political enemy with Sear, and it's quite bizarre to imagine this political relationship gone horribly wrong. Huey obviously thought that the consequences of leaving Sear in charge were bad enough that he couldn't risk it, so he announced that he was going to leave his Senate seat vacant until a new governor, hopefully a long loyalist, was elected to replace him. This was clearly a move that benefited Huey far more than it did Louisiana, who would be without a senator for four months. But Huey brushed off these concerns. He joked, I shall have to stay out of the Senate for four months, leaving the place as vacant as it has been for the last 32 years. A normal politician would probably have waited until 1932, when he could run against the other sitting senator. But Huey saw his chance to increase his stranglehold on the politics of the state. And, as biographer T. Harry Williams puts it, he could never wait or hold back, he had to rush on to wider scenes, to greater power, to his destiny. It's also worth noting that his program in Louisiana had started to stall. Maybe the people would get sick of him if he didn't suddenly change things, if he didn't get a mandate to pass his program. But the more important thing for Huey was personal ambition. As senator, the nightmare of every Louisiana conservative could eventually feasibly come to pass. President Long. If Huey often seems to be well-matched against his political opponents, we have to remember two things. One is that he was usually smart enough to choose those opponents, and the other is that we have the benefit of hindsight. Joseph Rancel, his opponent, was 72 and deeply conservative, and he'd been senator for decades without really achieving anything of note. With his long service, sterling reputation, and vast war chests of political funds behind him, you would struggle to find a better incumbent and a more perfect symbol of the establishment, and the type of tired politics that Huey was railing against and broke so sharply with. 
yet decades of Louisiana tradition meant that it was very rare for an incumbent senator to be denied re-election. But this was now 1930, and the Great Depression was beginning to bite. Politics as usual, and Ransell's carefully polished gentlemanly charm, would not be enough to satisfy the poor and desperate of Louisiana. Even Ransell's own propaganda was turned against him. When a delegation of housewives presented him with a feather duster, symbolising his cleanliness in government, a gleeful Huey began taunting him with the nickname Old Feather Duster. His contempt for Ransell was great enough that he regularly asked the huge crowds at his rallies in these small forgotten towns in the middle of nowhere, Do you even know who your current senator is? All the while, his pet newspaper, the Louisiana Progress, published in far off Mississippi, you'll note, to avoid libel laws, squeezed a few adverts, sports sections, and the Lonely Hearts ads between its wall-to-wall prolonged propaganda. During the campaign, the paper was distributed to voters free of charge. Huey had found a way to get around the lying newspapers, and for the first time, he toured the state in a specially constructed truck that could drive around and amplify his speeches to adoring audiences. As the campaign geared up, as seems to be the inevitable case in the morass of Louisiana politics, the rhetoric and the tactics on both sides got particularly vicious. Surrogates for Rancel, they denounced Huey as an ultra-socialist who had the face of a clown, the heart of a petty larceny burglar, and the disposition of a tyrant. The conservatives appealed to the basest instincts of Louisiana politics and the tactics of the old demagogues. They compared Huey to the occupying Unionist generals after the Civil War and engaged in considerable race-baiting. Once the race card had been played, the Conservatives were arguing that Huey's refusal to endorse a judge appointed by Rancel was because he was in league with the NAACP. But once people had started using the race card, Long and his team were hardly above using it. They dug up a friendly letter that Rancel had written to a black politician in New Orleans, and mocked him mercilessly for it. A vote for Labour rights and white supremacy is a vote against Rancel. Huey's paper proclaimed. It sounds disgusting to us now, but that was the kind of thing that won you votes back then. Race baiting was unfortunately very par for the course in southern politics of this era. But this was far from the most dramatic and lurid episode of the election. Remember Huey's pretty young secretary, Alice Lee Grosjean? She was always very close to Huey, and her family members were seen as potentially privy to some very interesting gossip. When one of them, Sam Irby, approached the Ransell team, offering to uncover a vast corruption scandal involving Huey and the Highways Commission, naturally the old senator was interested to hear what he had to say. But he wouldn't get the chance. A week before the election, members of Huey's private police force, allegedly including Huey's own cousin, burst into the room that Irby was sharing with Alice Lee's ex-husband. Apparently they'd been discussing how best to expose their affair to the media. Both men were arrested. The scene in the room with Huey's advisers after this kidnapping would have been a good fly on the wall moment. It seems like it was maybe closer to the thick of it than the House of Cards. Earl, Huey's brother, was allegedly in favour of having them killed, but Huey shouted him down, finally finding his moral compass, or maybe just realising that getting away with actual political murder is kind of tricky. The bizarre compromise they came up with? The two men were shipped off to an island in the middle of the river, Grand Isle, while Huey figured out what to do next. Unfortunately for the Long Camp, the disappearance of two notable public figures didn't exactly go unnoticed, and wild rumours began to fly around in the anti-Long press. A lot of people likely thought that the hapless men were sleeping with the fishes, shot and dumped in a river, or being held in a state prison. Huey realised that he might have to address the little matter of kidnapping and imprisoning witnesses, before the election. In classic Louisiana fashion, political enemies suddenly appeared in public with their positions completely and mysteriously reversed. Irby, with either a gun or a checkbook being brandished in his face, appeared on the radio to bizarrely explain the situation the night before the election. He'd been on a, um, fishing trip. Yes, that's the ticket. All the charges against the good governor should of course be dropped immediately. Now there's obviously an element of the hilariously absurd in this story. The idea of Huey and his cronies kidnapping these men, then frantically deciding what to do with the drunk men that they'd kidnapped. But Huey never forgot his enmity for Irby. Irby mysteriously lost every state job he ever had. He was confined to an insane asylum at one point, 
and his wife suspiciously left him immediately after accepting a cushy job with Huey. You have to question the viciousness of a man who used his powers of patronage not just to maintain power, but to crush and humiliate his enemies. By the time Irby published his lurid book, Kidnapped by the Kingfish, explaining his side of the story, he was already a laughing stock. It looked like the desperate last move of a broken man. Meanwhile, of course, there was another tense election night to go for the Long Camp. Now you'll remember from the governor's election that the anti-Long base was essentially in New Orleans, while Huey could rely on support from his base in the countryside. The small towns that he toured in his campaigning frenzy, whipping up a storm in his sound truck, these were overwhelmingly pro-Long. As in lots of Louisiana elections, there were some irregularities. It was very kind of the 2,400 voters in St Bernard to vote for Huey nearly 4,000 times. It was also notable that Charlie Chaplin voted for Huey there, at least according to the records. Maybe he was just taking some time out from his busy Hollywood schedule to get involved in local Louisiana politics. It all smells a little bit like that one election episode of Blackadder. Huey, for his part, when he was asked about some of the curious results from St Bernard, said that ah, a lot of people there live on houseboats and the census takers can't have found them all. Which um, seems reasonable enough. I mean, I'm sure Babe Ruth did have a houseboat in St Bernard, Louisiana. In reality, though, Huey had enough support in the countryside that this um, overzealous vote counting was probably overkill. But it all came down to New Orleans. When the results came in, the Ransell camp knew they were sunk. Ransell did win New Orleans, but only by 4,000 votes. It was nowhere near enough, and Huey took the state by 150,000 to 110,000. Somewhere, in a little notebook, he could put a tick next to the box that said, Become US Senator. And there was only one box left to tick. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now!, If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate us or review us on iTunes, Stitcher, your favourite podcast network. Tell your friends about us. You can contact us via Facebook, Twitter, and even donate to the show via PayPal if you think you're doing a good job. And of course, the more people you tell, the fewer posters I have to death-defyingly stick up on motorway bridges. Next episode, we'll see what the Senate makes of Huey Long, and what he makes of them. Until then, be kind to each other. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zinadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A.bandcamp.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode.